whose art survives him is the story of a painter whose name, in all probability, you've never heard before. It is worthwhile to be reminded in this age of instant celebrity that most artists never know fame. They work in obscurity, often enough in lifelong obscurity, from which every once in a great while, posthumously, they may be rescued by some accident of fate. Terence Smith now on the art and the fate of Ellis Ruley. Norwich, Connecticut. This picturesque New England town was home to a self-taught painter named Ellis Ruley, who spent his life creating from his imagination a singular and vivid universe. I think he had a wonderful uh, sense of color, a very intuitive uh, sense of uh, design as well. He uses uh, house paint as his medium, and he uh, uses mostly cardboard or card table tops, masonite boards as his canvas. And uh, the combination is just a wonderful, rich, very novel uh, look. A construction worker by day and a painter at night, Ellis Ruley really never sought attention. He kept to himself. wasn't loud, uh, boisterous. He just quiet. Ellis Ruley's nephew, John Ruley. Whatever was on him being a quiet man, he just put it on canvas. He painted. He liked it. I think he liked it more than anything else. The secret of this gentleman's paintings might never have gained a wider audience except for the detective work of Glenn Robert Smith, a folk art collector who bought one of Ruley's works at a flea market and then spent three years trying to find out more about the artist and his life. In the process, he uncovered a tale of intrigue and possibly murder. What drew me to the, to the art, I suspect it's, uh, it was the stark whiteness of the characters, almost a ghostly-like uh, quality. The painting that caught Glenn Smith's eye was Ruley's Adam and Eve. It is now the cover of a new book Smith has written on the painter's life. Very soon after my investigation, uh, after showing it to family members, uh, I was told by numerous people that that is Alice, that was, it is a self-portrait of him and his white wife, Wilhelmina, and uh, that he thought of his home as this Garden of Eden. Ellis Ruley bought his home in a previously all-white neighborhood of Norwich in 1933 with money he received in an insurance settlement after a car accident. Dad, remember over there? My grandfather had pride in those dogwood trees. We brought Gladys May Ruley and her daughter Diane LaSalle to visit the site where they were raised by Ellis Ruley. He had built a little easel he made himself. Yeah. And uh, he'd take the kerosene lamp, he'd get his paint brushes and whatever, and he just wanted complete silence because he was thinking in his mind what he wanted to paint. What was interesting about uh, Ellis Ruley is that he would uh, choose from uh, magazines and newspapers uh, photographs that uh, I would consider rather tacky photographs and make works of art out of them. Uh, this is really a remarkable feat. Joseph Gualtieri, the director of the Slater Memorial Museum in Norwich, discovered Ellis Ruley's paintings in the early 1950s and tried to find him an art dealer. In New York, actually, there was no interest at that time. I think it's very unfortunate that it has taken so many years for Ellis Rule to be uh, noticed, to be recognized. In Ruley's universe, there is a deep undercurrent of tension, a sense of impending danger. And as Glenn Smith researched his book, he began to see another facet of Ruley's hometown. But I noticed in most of the white people I talked to, the, the storekeepers and the people on the street, there was this uh, darting of the eyes. Whenever I'd ask a question, they'd all look at each other and as if there was something to be hidden. As the neighborhood's first interracial family, the Ruleys were not warmly accepted by their neighbors. Nephew John Ruley. Yeah, was, at that time, was very, wasn't to everybody's liking to see a colored man with a white woman, see? And they didn't like it. I had trouble because the kids used to either hit me or bother me. 
or they used to make fun of my hair because they'd say, well, your hair is different from ours. And uh, uh, I used to come home and tell my grandfather, and he'd say, well, just ignore it, go to school, and don't bother them. But the Ruley family could not ignore the world around them. In 1948, Alice Ruley's son-in-law was found mysteriously drowned in the family well. As violence closed in, Ruley continued to paint, often depicting animals cornered and confronting danger. My grandfather really didn't let things upset him too bad, because like I said, when something really bothered him and he got it off of his mind or whatever, he was right back into the paintings. So I think this is what uh, sort of relaxed him a lot, just to be by himself and paint. Eleven years after his son-in-law's death, on January 18, 1959, Ellis Ruley was himself found dead, his body frozen and bloody. His death was ruled accidental by local authorities, a finding the family rejects to this day. I would say, truthfully, that he was murdered. My grandfather was uh, murdered for, for the property because there was always a bitter argument over that property that my grandfather had because so many people had offered to buy it from him uh, for the simple f uh, fact they came uh, right out and said, we don't want no niggers over here. That's what they said in those days. Six months after Ellis Ruley's death, his house, probably containing many of his paintings, was burned to the ground. Only the foundation remains. If the intent was to get rid of this man and their family, it sure worked because now the property is, is now out of the family's name against their will. Was Ellis Ruley murdered? The answer may never be known. But what is no longer ignored is the beauty of his painting. Here is a person who brought a breath of fresh air, a fresh vision, and made this world, as he presented it, an exciting place to contemplate. Even the plants and trees seem to be a singing a joy of living. Today, 35 years after his death, Ellis Ruley is finally recognized. At the Museum of American Folk Art in New York, plans are being made for 60 of his works to be exhibited on a nationwide tour. For the quiet man from Norwich who sought shelter in painting from the indignities of racism, his art has prevailed.